Well, through this uh, time of an opportunity to invest together in mission, we are also exploring the metaphor of light in the Scriptures and what that means for who God is, for who we are, and what it means to be disciples of Jesus. Last week, we opened up by talking about the light of glory as God manifests His glory in the image of light. And we explored how Moses came down off Mount Sinai in Exodus 34, and as he did so, his face was shining. And why was his face shining? We said his face was shining because he was in communion with God. His uh, face was shining as he was reflecting the Lord's glory, and his face was shining as he was commissioned to bear witness to the light of God. Today, we'll continue this uh, study of light as we talk about light as life, light as life. And this uh, will be explored in the words of Jesus, actually was our call to worship this morning, uh, from the Gospel of John chapter 8. And uh, it's a one verse, but I think it's worth, you know, will, you stand, will you please stand with me as we read this? Uh, we stand, I know we were just standing, but you know, the Word of God is worth standing for, is living and active, and is here at work in our hearts this morning. This is the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. When Jesus spoke again to the people, He said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. And we continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this, Your word to us. We pray that as we are here this morning, that You would be present as our teacher. Open our eyes with Your light that we might see, open our ears that we might hear, change our hearts that we would turn and be transformed into the image of Jesus from one degree of glory to another. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So as this morning, as we contemplate, what does it mean to say that Jesus is the light of life? What does that mean for who Jesus is? For who we are as human beings, what does it look like to walk in darkness? Because Jesus says, if you're following me, you will never walk in darkness. And what does it mean to walk in the light of life? So the first thing we want to explore together is this question or about the nature of life. And this is something that uh, from this pulpit we've talked about before, but it's always good to have this reminder about how God has made us as human beings. Because life is sustained for us as human beings in several different ways. In Genesis chapter 2, as God is making humanity, He makes them of two constituent elements. And here's how it says, it says, the Lord God formed the man, one, from the dust of the ground, two, from the breath that comes from His mouth. And when these two constitutive elements are brought together, the man becomes a living being. Now, when you look to the rest of the creation narrative, notice that there is no other instance where God takes a lion or something else and forms the creature in this way. Man is a special creation of God made in His image with two constitutive elements. One is a physical element from the dust of the ground, and the other is a spiritual element as life comes from the breath of God breathed into Him. So if life is going to be sustained, life will be sustained by God physically, and life is sustained by God spiritually. Now, today we will be focusing, obviously, on the spiritual aspect, but let us not forget the physical aspect as well. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, recognizes that as humanity, God is the one who sustains us physically. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, for I tell you, do not worry about your what? Life. And life, Jesus recognizes, is physical. What is necessary to sustain physical life for a human being? One, food. You must eat. If not, you will die. Second is water. If you do not drink, you will die. 
And third is clothing and shelter, because God has created humanity, as we call, warm-blooded, which means that if your body temperature is not… Let's just all go outside for three hours and see how well that goes, okay? <laughs> we need to be sustained physically. Now, Jesus tells His disciples, He tells you this morning, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about this physical maintaining, because your heavenly Father knows that you need to be sustained that way, and He will take care of you. Now, in the midst of that, Jesus is saying, look at the birds of the air, right, and things like that. God takes care of them physically, and so He will take care of you. And God takes care of all of humanity that way. It is not simply those who profess Jesus as Lord that God takes care of physically. It's everyone. Later on, when the Jesus is talking about we as followers of Christ loving our enemies, are we called to love our enemies and to do good to those who persecute us? Is that easy to do? Is it an obligation that you must obey? If you follow Jesus, it is. And here's what God, Jesus says about God's loving His enemies, and here's what He says. He says, He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. In other words, God, because He's a merciful, loving God, sustains the physical life of all of humanity. Every single time you sit down to eat a meal, thank God He has provided that for you. If He was to cease the sun from shining, we have eight minutes to go because that's how long it takes light to reach the sun to earth. If he would cease to have all the natural processes to be sustained, we would not live. But God does not simply sustain our life physically. God has designed us to sustain our life spiritually as well. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 in the Torah, as Moses is talking to the second generation just before they're going into the land, he looks back over how God cared for the Israelites in the desert, and he says that God provided for them, uh, but he also was teaching them. And here's what he says. He says, God humbled you, causing you to hunger and feeding you with manna. He, 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 he caused you to have a deprivation in your physical life. Okay, that's what I mean. If God withholds food, he's saying, I'm withholding physical sustenance from you. Now, I did that to teach you something, that I provide for you, and I did that to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, that your life is not simply sustained physically, but there is another life that is sustained by God, and that is spiritual. Man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Now, remember, it was when man was formed, he breathed from his mouth, and he breathed life into the human being. And what God is saying is, I am to sustain you, not simply physically, but to sustain you spiritually. Those are the words, obviously, that Jesus used to rebuke Satan as Satan was tempting him. Rather than depending on God to provide for him physically, he says what? Turn those rocks into bread. We are to depend upon the Lord for our physical life and as well as our spiritual life. And interestingly, in the New Testament, as the Apostle Paul is reflecting back on this episode of God caring for the Israelites in the wilderness, Paul makes it clear that God, yes, provided for the Israelites physically. I mean, you can think about, obviously, manna from heaven, but is, is God also providing for the Israelites physically with water? Think about the times, you know, the water coming from the rock and such. And what the Apostle Paul recognizes is that God was also sustaining them spiritually as well. And here's how he puts it in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, our ancestors, which is interesting because he's writing to Greeks, but he's saying our ancestors. So the ancestors that of the Greeks are no longer to be the Greek ancestors, but now they have a new story. Same for you. Our ancestors were baptized. Fascinating that he used that word into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they ate the same spiritual food and the same spiritual drink. All of a sudden, Paul is recognizing that the Israelites were sustained not just simply physically but spiritually, and what is it that sustained them spiritually according to the Apostle Paul? Messiah. Messiah provided for them. 
There is one people of God through history, and Messiah provides for them. The Israelites in the wilderness, and you and I today in this room. So given that, that life is to be sustained by God physically and life is sustained by God spiritually, what does Jesus mean when he says, if you follow me because I am the light of the world, you will not walk, you will not walk he says, in darkness? What does it mean to say that there is a darkness that the world walks in? What does life look like in the dark? Because the Scriptures say that for those that are outside of life in Christ, that they are spiritually dead. And that because of sin, the life of the Spirit is cut off. And yet, when we see people living in the world, we see them with a kind of a spiritual life. Is it fair to say, like, what does this mean when the Bible says you're spiritually dead, but yet are we saying that people in the world don't have souls? That they have no spirit? Is that what we're saying? You know, the St. Augustine was kind of contemplating that in the city of God. What does it mean to say that people who are cut off from God are cut off from life? And here's what he says. He says, for although the soul may be called dead due to sin, when it lacks a certain kind of life on its own, namely the Spirit of God, by which it could also have lived wisely and happily, it nonetheless continues to live by virtue of a kind of life, although miserable, is still properly its own because it was created immortal. We believe that the soul of humanity is immortal. When the souls of the righteous and the unrighteous, when the, oh, sorry, when the, when the human person dies, righteous or unrighteous, their body ceases to exist, yes? Now, that means that the, the physical sustainment of that life has ceased bodily, physically. Does the life of the soul continue? For the unrighteous? Yes, because we believe that the soul, the spirit, is, is created immortal. Now, actually, later on, when we're resurrected, are the righteous resurrected when Jesus comes back? Yes, obviously. Is the unrighteous resurrected? Yes. Will the unrighteous receive back a body that is immortal? There's debate about that, but I'd say yes. Yes, it is so that you will receive back a body that is immortal, whether you're righteous or unrighteous. There's debate about that. So what does it mean to say we live life in darkness? You're physically dead. It means you're cut off from life. You have an existence. But think about zombies. I mean, do zombies have a kind of existence? <laughs> now, I'm not going to be unkind to anybody, but do the zombies have a kind of existence? Yes, there's a kind of existence there, but we would definitely, as St. Augustine would call it, miserable. And I want to suggest that if you're outside of Christ, you know, Jesus, when he's talking to Nicodemus, says, that which is born of flesh is flesh. And in order to have a spiritual life, you must be born again, because that which is spiritual, born of the Spirit, is spirit. So there's a kind of life, but it's almost like a zombieish kind of life. But yet every single person who has a spirit is also created to have that life sustained. Yet they are cut off from the sustainment of life, and they continue to exist. Do you understand why that would be miserable? Imagine if you hungered and thirst, you could not satisfy that, but you didn't die. Imagine that kind of life. What I'm suggesting is that's life for those outside of Christ spiritually. They have nothing to sustain them, but they don't die. Now, what does that look like? There's a, a passage in Ecclesiastes that, that kind of goes into this a little bit. Because the world is, is the world seeking for life? Is the world trying to seek to fill this need that they have that, you know, just like if you hungered and thirst, you would do anything you can to just try to fill that up, and even if nothing worked, you would keep trying because your body is screaming for something. Their soul's screaming for something, and they're trying to fill it, but nothing works because there's only one true source of life. And the book of Ecclesiastes goes into that a little bit. So the author of Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, he, he talks about this, and he says in chapter 2, I want to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I, I want to see the ways that people try to find life, as he says, uh, un, you know, under, the, uh, under the sun. And here's some things that he mentions. He says this, look, uh, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself, vineyards, gardens, parks, kinds of fruit trees and reservoirs of water and groves of flourishing trees. He's kind of saying, I threw myself into work and accomplishment. Does the world try to find life through work and accomplishment? Absolutely. 
He says, I, I tried that out. I'm going to try to find life this way. He said, and then I went on. I, I, I tried beyond just having great projects. I, I went and bought male and female slaves. I had other slaves who were born in my house. I had great possession, possessions. I had herds and flocks more than anyone in Jerusalem before me. Does the world try to find life in material possessions? Do you? Do you find life in your work? Is that your life? He says, I went on and I got lots of money. The treasures of kings and provinces. Do people try to find life and money? Then I acquired male and female singers. Do people try to find life and entertainment? Then I got a harem. Do people find life and sexual pleasures? All the delights of a man's heart. I denied myself nothing. I refused my heart no pleasure. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and all that I toiled to achieve, what did it all amount to? Nothing. Everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing, nothing was gained under the sun. This helps us to put in the, the words of Jesus because he's saying, look, the words of Jesus says this, you can gain the whole world. You can gain the whole world. That's what exactly what the, uh, the teacher in Kohelet says in, in Ecclesiastes. I denied myself nothing. I went after everything the world had to offer me. And at the end of it, it was meaningless. And Jesus says, you can do that. You can try to find life in everything the world has to give you. And at the end, it will cost you your soul. You can gain it, but it'll cost you your soul. One person that, that kind of gives us a literary picture of this and what this could look like uh, is the character Macbeth in Shakespeare. Macbeth is someone, if you know that story, it's actually an excellent new production of that Denzel Washington taking the leading roles. Excellent. Shakespeare, uh, I'm sorry, Macbeth, is someone who pursued what the world had to offer him, particularly when it came to prestige and reputation and position, and he kills to get there, if you know the story. And the character of Macbeth, as every single person in the world does, has a vision of life, what he thinks life will be like when he gets there. So if you think life is found in work, you have a picture in your mind of what life will be like when you accomplish everything you want to accomplish. It's going to be great. You have a vision of the good life through work. Or if, you're, you know, if you have a vision of the good life through possessions, you have a good vision of the good life through sex, you have a vision of the good life through money, you have a vision of the good life through vacation, whatever it is. So did Macbeth. He had a vision of the good life that he was going to achieve by accomplishing all the world had to offer. And here's what he said when he actually achieved it. He said, I have lived long enough. My way of life has fallen into the sear of the yellow leaf. He's the, towards the end of life. And that which should accompany old age, that which I was looking forward to and all that I sacrificed to accomplish, I, I thought I'd have honor and love and obedience, troops of friends. I look not to have those things. But in their stead, I have curses, not loud but deep, mouth honor, flatterers, breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. And then at the end, as Macbeth is looking back over at his life and what he accomplished in the pursuit of what the world has to offer, he says what I think every person who's unrighteous at the end of life will say when they look back after death. Life's but a poor walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound, full of fury, signifying nothing. This is Scripture as told by the author of Ecclesiastes. You can gain the whole world, and at the end, it signifies nothing. And by the way, before we want, is there a religious way of doing this? This is just for people who are outside the church. Can people in the church do this too? Yeah? Yeah, you bet. Is it possible to be in the church and try to find life but not in Christ? Absolutely. One of the people that Jesus often had interactions with was the Pharisees. Pharisees were incredibly religious. 
and yet they had no life in Messiah. And as Jesus talks to them, here's how he describes where they find life. Everything they do is done for people to see. Where is a Pharisee finding life? Is it in Messiah? It's in other people and their reputation, what people say about them. That's where life is found for them. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and called rabbi by others. So just because we're here this morning doesn't mean that we aren't in the same boat walking in darkness. Are you finding life in Messiah? And what does it mean to say to live life in the light? I am the light, Jesus says. If you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What does that look like? What does that mean? And again, going back to Deuteronomy, this is case chapter 30, as Moses is talking to the Israelites, he says, I put before you all these commandments, all the word of God, and he says, I can call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life, choose light, that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. As we say on this side of the resurrection, Jesus Messiah is your life. So here's when we close. Just one quick quote. It's interesting to contemplate here. There's an Anglican priest. His name was William Law. And he said this, if you have not chosen the kingdom of God first, it will in the end make no difference what you have chosen instead. G.K. Chesterton said, there's innumerable ways to fall down, but only one way to stand up straight. It doesn't matter what you choose. Now, C.S. Lewis read this quote, and he got thinking as he read William Law. And in one of the last sermons he ever gave, C.S. Lewis in a, it later came out as an essay called A Slip of the Tongue. Here's what C.S. Lewis said about this William Law quote. He said, these are hard words to take. Will it really make no difference? Whether it was women or patriotism, cocaine or art, Whiskey or a seat in the cabinet, money or science? Or is he, he's comparing something we might outrightly say is evil and something else we might say is good. Does it make no difference whether I'm a thief or a, a, someone who works for the public good? Does it not matter? He says it makes no difference. We shall have missed the end for which we are formed and rejected the only thing that satisfies, the only place there's life. Does it matter to a man dying in a desert by which choice of route he missed the only well? All of us, apart from Messiah Jesus, are wandering in a desert spiritually. We are crying out for life. There is one well. And some of us might be upset and like, why is there only one? Why is there only one? May we better yet say, thank God there is one. Do we deserve one? Thank God there is one, and it is available to all. And as we come to the table and we celebrate the Lord's Supper, let's be reminded of the words of Jesus in John chapter 6. Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. The Apostle Paul said that the Israelites in the desert were sustained with spiritual food and spiritual drink. As we come to the Lord's table, we are just like the Israelites. The Israelites were baptized, and they fed upon the Messiah, so says Paul. And so we as well are baptized set apart as the family and people of God. And just as the Israelites were sustained by Messiah in the wilderness, so we are sustained spiritually by Messiah today as we come to his table. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the bread of life and he is living water. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you sustain us physically as you cause the rain to fall, you cause the sun to shine. Forgive us where we take for granted our dinner tonight. It is a gift. And Lord, just as that which is born of flesh is flesh, we pray we'll be born again by the Spirit, that we would no longer be cut off from 
spiritual life because of sin. But because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, as He has paid the penalty for us, so we are then brought near in communion to life once more. And we are then made able and fit to receive the life which was breathed into us at the very formation of our first Father, which then is a new and a fresh blown into our hearts as you sustain us spiritually as well. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.